Persona 5 Royal has finally released worldwide, and thanks to Atlas West, I was given a review code to get a head start on playing the game for this review. First off, if you don't know who I am, my name is Spencer Presley, and even though I've been hosting the Shin Megami Tensei Network podcast since 2012, I somehow never actually beat Persona 5 until March of 2020 for various life reasons. Leading up to the English release of Royal, though, I was extra motivated to finally beat the original release of Persona 5. And not just to finally knock it off my backlog of shame, but also to really see how much the content in Royal has actually changed. So, once I rolled credits on Persona 5, and then later Persona 5 Royal, I felt extremely satisfied with both the experiences, even back to back. The only thing I couldn't get out of my head the whole time I was playing Royal was why the game has been reviewed so highly, and even more confused at how the game is currently the best reviewed game in 2020 according to Metacritic as of this writing in April 2020. So, before we get too far into this review, I just want to say that there will be spoilers discussed, and I highly, highly recommend you watch this review after beating the game for yourself as to not spoil the experience. I have been very critical of Persona 5 Royal, right from the initial announcement, as the game is still relatively new, having only been released in the West back in 2017 for PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4. Still, Atlas is no stranger to re-releasing games with new story elements or gameplay changes with titles like Persona 3 FES, Persona 3 Portable, and Persona 4 Golden. So, releasing an enhanced version of Persona 5 on PlayStation 4 almost three years after its original release on the same platform it launched on was bound to make some people wonder what Royal could do to actually justify the $60 asking price. Not only that, but asking players to replay this 80 plus hour long story just to experience a whole new story instead of just letting the new story elements be playable right from the start, similar to how Persona 3 FES did with its epilogue, The Answer. It's really asking a lot. As soon as you start up Persona 5 Royal, it goes out of its way to try and make you think that things are going to be vastly different. With the casino introduction showing off things like the grappling hook, and even having Kasumi appear out of nowhere to join Joker in battle. Sadly, this is not the case, and as soon as you flash back and start the game properly, you are greeted with much of the same story from the original Persona 5. Persona 5 Royal was heavily marketed as being a brand new experience and a new take on the Persona 5 story, when in reality, it is more of a glorified director's cut, which is pretty ironic considering that the original director isn't even involved in Royal. But you still get the point. The story has a lot of little changes that new players would just expect to be in the game such as Haru being seen at school from the very beginning and not halfway through the game when the story wills her into existence. Little changes here and there are nice for fans and overall help the storytelling in the game. Royal even adds in more voice acting scenes throughout the game. While the newly voiced scenes are great, it is still a shame that Royal doesn't commit even more and feature full voice acting for the game's story, as easily half of the game is portrayed directly through text only. For a game as long as this, it would obviously be a very costly feature to add, but unfortunately, by only adding a couple of new scenes, it makes the unvoiced ones stand out even more, especially after coming off another Atlas-developed JRPG that came out this year with Tokyo Mirage Sessions Encore for the Switch, which had most of its story sections fully voice acted. There are three major new characters added exclusively to Royal, and surprisingly, I actually love them all for vastly different reasons. Let's start off with Kasumi who has easily been the most heavily marketed as a new character you can not only start a confidant with, but who can eventually join as a playable Phantom Thief. I focus on the word eventually because Atlas unfortunately decided to sprinkle her throughout the main story and really save most of her plot development for when you get to the new story content in the game at the very end. Right off the bat, it is immediately apparent that they are holding back most of Kasumi's story by only featuring 5 confidant ranks when compared to everyone else in the game who features 10. This is due to Kasumi having a big secret that she hides from everyone until the new story happens at the end of the game in the new year. Kasumi as a confidant before the new year is nothing too special from her introduction, but at the same time never feels like too much of a pain to be around. Sadly, 
After she is at rank 5, you never really have any reason to talk to her again, which leads to people ignoring, which led to me ignoring her optional side events for almost half of the entire game. The game even goes out of its way to not add Kasumi into the Phantom Thieves for very underwhelming reasons. At first, the game tries to make you believe that she is not in favor of the Phantom Thieves similar to Akechi, but whatever principles that keep her from joining you in the later half of the game quickly disappear when the plot decides to focus solely on her. This is a very underdeveloped aspect in regards to Kasumi, and would have been interesting to look more into three opposing beliefs between Kasumi, Akechi, and the Phantom Thieves. Thankfully, Kasumi's story isn't all wasted potential, and that is thanks to the big reveal that Kasumi was actually her deceased sister the whole time, and her real name is Sumire. Kasumi was the older sister, and learning more about the two's relationship is what leads Sumeri to becoming Kasumi. Kasumi was the older sister, and learning more about these two's relationship as well as what led Sumeri to becoming Kasumi is nothing original, especially by Persona standards. This is nothing even new to the series. But it is a well-developed story that helps flesh out the character more and more. Sumeri on the surface may just seem like Kasumi with her hair down, but after maxing out the rest of her confidant, you get a much better understanding of what the two sisters' relationship was actually like before Kasumi's deadly accident. Playing as Kasumi as well is a nice addition to your party, but ultimately feels too short-lived to feel satisfying. The only time you get full control of her in your party is at the very end of the game, and that means she can only be used in the final palace as well as mementos. This frustration would be alleviated a little bit if Kasumi could join your party through the whole game after starting New Game Plus, but sadly, this is not the case. Next up is Jose, which in the game is pronounced Jose, but for this review, until the end of time, he will always be referred to as Jose. You meet your new friend within Mementos, and Jose has no real relevance to the main overarching story, which is fine because he just exists to help flush out Mementos and make it a lot more fun. Jose drives around Mementos in his car looking for flowers. These flowers allow him to drink them up and learn more about humans. In reality, this just gives you a new collectible to collect as you dive deeper and deeper along with stamps. Flowers are to be collected and used to buy items, but once you leave Mementos, you lose all of your current flowers, so it's important to spend them before you leave the metaverse. Stamps, on the other hand, are special because they are given out at the end of each level when diving down into Mementos and sometimes hidden within the walls. When you trade in stamps to Jose, he can actually increase three things. The experience you earn in battle, the amount of money you earn after each battle, and he can even increase the number of items you find within exploring each floor. These collectibles, along with new randomized elements, really keep mementos from feeling stale. Also, don't worry, there are multiple songs now to listen to as you dive around. Also, don't worry, there are now multiple songs to drive around mementos listening to, so you won't be stuck hearing the same song for your entire playthrough. Finally, there is easily the biggest character surprise to Persona 5 Royal, and that is Dr. Maruki, who is introduced shortly after the first palace of the game is completed. Maruki is the school's new counselor and quickly reaches out to you and the other students at your school to offer his services. For most of the beginning, Maruki doesn't appear like that deep of a character, and that's fine. He is always there to lend an ear to the students, He's, he genuinely wants everyone to be happy, all the girls think he is cute, and the man loves himself some snacks. The story told through his confidant rank is nothing really that special, as it just goes into helping him research for his paper on cognitive science. That all changes, though, towards the last few ranks of his story. You start to learn more about Maruki in an excellent scene where the two of you are eating at a buffet together when an old friend of Maruki shows up and joins you. After you finish ranking up Maruki's confidant, you then don't see him until the new year starts in the story, and it's revealed that he is a palace ruler. Thankfully though, thankfully this is not the tied and true overuse plot of evil teacher tricking you into thinking you were friends the whole time. Due to the time you spent with Maruki, and the way the story treats that relationship, it helps make the end of the game shine as easily the best part of the overall story. This is in large part due to the writing as well. The English voice acting has seen a considerable bump in quality when compared to the original game and even the rest of Royal. Maruki shines brightly as well due to not only spending so much time with him leading up to this, but also because as you traverse deeper into his palace, you delve deeper into his 
psyche and the reasonings of why he's doing all of this. The game does this extremely well in the form of VHS tapes, that have you watch them in order to progress, you get a glimpse into why Maraki lost his grant for his life's research, lost the love of his life, and even shows how he obtained his persona. The fact that Maraki is an adult persona user is nothing new to the series, but it's been so long since we've explored an adult character like this and it is very much appreciated. By the way, his persona's final form, Adam Kadmon, which is an awesome callback to Shin Megami Tensei 9 that many fans will probably not pick up on since that was an exclusive Xbox game that never left Japan unfortunately. Returning members of the Phantom Thieves and even Confidants have few minor new scenes outside of the story content at the end of the year. Everyone now gets a phone call to Joker as he heads home as a way of earning a few extra points and ranking them up faster. While there are some nice, funny, or even sweet moments, most of them basically ended up feeling like flavor text. The only real standout to this rule is Akechi Goro, whose confidant rank has seen the biggest glow up. In the original game, you would run into each other at fixed points in the story, ranking up automatically, and now the player gets to spend time with him manually, ranking up in a completely new story. The evolution from starting off as a detective and then ending up as your true rival is really something to behold. No part of Joker and Akechi's story ever felt like filler to me, and makes their bond all the more interesting especially if you already know what happens to him at the end of the original game. The story moments with him only get better as the new year starts. The rivalry is still there, but the mask of who Akechi is is no longer present, so you get to spend some much needed time with him being 100% himself. Robbie Damon, the English voice actor, kills it at portraying this version of an unfiltered Akechi, and by the end of the story, I was not expecting to be more emotionally attached than I have ever been with anyone else in this game. The final calling card scene will remain one of the most chilling parts of this game's story for so many reasons and something I will never forget. Now, while the story elements may be uneven in terms of distribution, the development team at P-Studio knocked it out of the park with Persona 5's core gameplay for Royal. There are tons of new changes that improve the overall experience, such as guns now reloading between battles. In the original game, you had a set amount of ammo each day for every party member's gun, and unfortunately, it just led to guns being viewed as precious resources that never actually ended up getting used. Now, gun damage has been buffed considerably considerably, and you are encouraged to just lay a slew of bullets, especially when it comes to weaker foes. Another great addition is the fact that all members can perform baton passes without needing to rank up their confidant. This now means that no character needs to be ignored until their confidant rank can start. This now means no longer needing to ignore Haru in her father's palace until she becomes available to tag in and out for extra moves. Other little changes added to the game like technical hits allow you to exploit more weaknesses in battle, and disaster shadows are new opponents letting you wipe out all other enemies on the field in one move and let you add up a ton of experience and just making you feel like you're playing Persona 5 at almost one and a half times speed. New additions to palaces are grappling hooks and will seeds. The grappling hook on the surface is introduced properly as no big deal really, and for the most part, that's pretty accurate to how you're going to feel after beating the game yourself. Atlas had a chance when developing Royal at redesigning the dungeons and making major changes to really trim the fat or mix things up with the design, but this is rarely the case sadly. In most examples, only a handful of new spots are added to each palace, and at most times these spots are only there to help you obtain one of three new will seeds located within each palace. Thankfully, the will seeds on the other hand are great new collectible to track down. Picking these up grants the whole party some much needed SP, and if you collect all three, you are granted a unique skill accessory. Skill accessories are brand new to Royal and bring a much needed improvement to the otherwise underused accessories from the previous game. These skill accessories give you moves that you can equip onto any party member, allowing them to have even more creativity when it comes to making your party as well as managing your skills. You're no longer limited to whatever your teammate's persona's elemental type is. The skills can range from simple buffs or even elemental attacks. If you take a skill accessory made from a palace's will seeds to Jose and Mementos though, you can have him refine it so that the skills are unique and usually involve a mixture of two skills at once. 
Demon Negotiation also gets a much needed facelift. Demons now have their attitude communicated clearly to the player by the UI as well as Morgana. This doesn't mean obtaining new allies has become a total cakewalk though, and thankfully just removes the feeling of random trial and error. This version of Negotiation struck the perfect balance for me in terms of required thinking as well as using my own skills of deduction. I really hope that future Persona and SMT games learn these lessons from Royal when it comes to Negotiation. Easily, one of the flashiest new additions to the gameplay this time in Persona 5 Royal are the Showtime attacks. These flashy attacks are unlocked once Makoto joins your party and can be executed by triggering a number of situations in battle. These combination attacks feature team-ups such as Makoto and Haru in a wrestling match, Ryuji and Yusuke shooting up a food bar together, and many other over-the-top situations that never got old to watch play out. The animations in these attacks are so smooth and so stunning that it almost makes you forget that this game is built off the skeletons of a PS3 game. Similar to adding in extra voice scenes though, it wasn't fully implemented into the full game, so it's hard not to shake that feeling that things like updating the old animations to match those of the Showtime attacks just came down to Atlas trying to keep the budget for Royal as as low as possible. The game also feels at odd with itself in regards to when you are in the final boss fight of the game. The cinematic elements have never hit harder from a presentation standpoint, yet the original game's final boss and palace on the other hand have absolutely nothing outstanding changed about them. This sticks out even more like a sore thumb since the game is heavily marketed as all the boss fights in the game being updated with new phases. While some touches like Akuma having a cognitive version of Haru aiding him in his boss fight benefit the overall fight, changes like Sai's roulette wheel now having more effects feel very inconsequential, and you'd be forgiven to not even knowing that these changes were new. It also has to be mentioned that the Akumura boss fight and the entire Holy Grail section stand out as two massive design oversights. The Akumura boss fight seems to have been playtested on safety and merciless only, leaving all the other difficulty modes in that fight no room for error and making everything more of a chore than it already was with the time limit. Also, the final trek into Mementos for the original game has you taking down the Holy Grail in what felt like an unneeded slog at the end of the original Persona 5 and is somehow even worse in Persona 5 Royal. This selection of mazes, boss fights, and overly long cutscenes added so little to the overall experience. So the fact that Royal decided to leave this entire palace almost entirely the same as the original is doubly insulting to returning players. Besides a handful of new chests that are now grappleable, there are no meaningful additions. The boss fight Yaldabaoth also ended up being the only major boss in the game with no new moves or phases added. If it wasn't for Royal's new ending boss fight, this would undoubtedly have left new players and returning players underwhelmed and unsatisfied. It's no surprise Persona 5 has always been a very stylized game, and Atlas used the style not only to capture audiences' attention, but also distract from the fact that, at its core, Persona 5 is a PlayStation 3 game. This is extremely apparent when the PlayStation 4 offered an extremely minor amount of visual and technical improvements in the original version of Persona 5 when compared to the PlayStation 3 version. Just take the PlayStation 4 Pro as an example of this as well. The Pro was a announced and released in 2016, the same year that Persona 5 released in Japan. Now, even though this game saw a worldwide release in 2017, the game never received a single update or patch to improve performance or even address issues that were made apparent after release. It surprises me though, when speaking of patches, that none of the quality of life or even bug fixes or even localization errors were ever offered to original owners of Persona 5. Say if you were one of the people who were offended by the beefy trend setter and one of the text change that is now present in Royal, you're just expected to pay $60 for the more politically correct version of this scene. Still, now that it has been three years since Persona 5 released to the world, did Atlas use this time to take advantage of everything the PlayStation 4 Pro has to offer? Well, the short answer is yes, kind of, but sometimes no, and 
let's be honest, at this point in the video, the thought of anything being really short has kind of been thrown out the window. So, for example, the resolution in Royal can achieve 4K through super sampling. This is a trick native to the PlayStation 4 Pro that does not actually display in 4K natively. This means it is an up image meant more to trick your TV than the player's eyes. The game also on any PlayStation 4 system runs at a smooth 30 frames per second. It's a nice improvement from the original, but it is jarring if you're a fan coming from Persona 5 Dancing or Scramble which ran at a solid 60 frames per second. Still, the game never feels like it's doing anything technically demanding, so possible reasons are that most of the original animations just wouldn't hold up when sped up to 60 frames per second. Also, while certain aspects of the game still pop and are as stylish as ever, there are still plenty of low-resolution models that would look more at home on a PlayStation 2 game. A brand new area to visit, Kichijoji shows off one of the most technically impressive parts for the game's social elements. But that's also not saying much. Kichijoji is not a sprawling area. It offers a handful of shops, a temple to find inner peace, a surprisingly relaxing jazz club, and a new hangout spot to play darts or watch your characters play billiards. So, while the new location is appreciated, it never keeps Tokyo from feeling like it's mainly made up of one-shot locations as well as menu screens. If old parts of the social life aspect of Persona 5 got as much tender love and care as Kichijoji does, it would extremely help the daily life activities feel even more immersive. So, while Persona 5 made strides in terms of feeling like you live in a big city, Royal still has a long way before Yakuza or even the original Shenmue should start feeling threatened. Thankfully, one area Royal totally knocks it out of the park is the brand new music by Shoji Meguro in Toshiki Konishi. Most of the Atlas Sound team who worked on the original game soundtrack did not return for Royal, but the handful that did return did an amazing job at not only adding a wide variety of new sounds, but also having made tracks that have immediately become instant classics, such as the ending boss theme, I Believe, which is performed by returning Persona 5 vocalist Lin and had lyrics written by the man, the myth, the legend himself, Lotus Juice who continues to show that he is a real talent for contributing to this series' music after Persona 3. Persona 5 Royal also adds in way more tracks than you would expect for an enhanced version of an Atlas game. It has more added tracks to it even when compared to stuff like Catherine Full Body, Persona 3 FES, and Persona 4 Golden. The new battle theme has already sparked debates as to which is the better song, Last Surprise or Take Over. Also, Shin Megami Tensei fans should be very pleased by the song Kichi Joji 1990X, which is a nice callback to the original Shin Megami Tensei, and is a nice reminder that there are still people at Atlas who care about these classic titles. The Thieves' Den has got to be one of the most criminally underplayed and less talked about parts of Persona 5 Royal. What is described as a palace maker for players is actually more of a love child between Persona 5's world and PlayStation Home. It's an open area that lets players run around and play as any phantom thief in a variety of different outfits. And this even includes running around as Morgana in their cat form. You have awards to display along the walls, which are unlocked by completing certain in-game achievements. These awards reward you with P coins. These coins are what unlock all things in the Thieves' Den. There are different items to buy and display in your Thieves' Den, with new pieces unlocking the more you play through the game, ranging from all sorts of shapes, sizes, monsters, and locations. Set pieces will attract characters who even have conversations about what they're looking at. Music stations also allow you to pick songs from almost the entire soundtrack to listen to at your own leisure. Unfortunately, you aren't able to make a playlist, and songs will just loop until you change them out. When you have the perfect song picked out, make sure to head over to the card tables. That is where you can learn the addicting new game, Tycoon. This is a completely optional card game that sucked me in for hours. It is a fast and surprisingly simple premise that kept me going for hours on end. For all the art fans out there, Atlas also went above and beyond when it comes to unlockable art section in the Thieves' Den. These pieces range from concept art, promotional art, in-game assets, and much more that can be zoomed in and viewed with incredible detail. Videos can also be watched on demand and unlocked as well. 
You can watch Showtime attacks, in-game cutscenes, animated cutscenes, trailers, and even such oddities like the intro to the Persona 5 OVA. The easiest standout for the video section has to be the footage from the live concerts, which is truly an amazing quality. Persona live concerts are truly a sight to behold if you've never seen them before. The team at Atlas really knocked it out of the park with the Thieves' Den, not only in terms of the bonus content you can view, but also just as a genuinely fun spot to hang out and spend time in. It's a shame though it is single player only, as so many multiplayer elements were screaming to be implemented. Okay, now it's time for the elephant in the room, and that is downloadable content. Yes, this re-released game being sold as the de facto way to play Persona 5 at the starting price of $60 has the gall to charge another $60 in DLC. Atlas has made the empty gesture of offering all original Persona 5 DLC free, unlike its original release in Japan. But any self-respecting game already would have bundled in this DLC and unlocked it from the start without needing you to download a separate key. Just look at Tokyo Mirage Sessions for example on the Switch. All the DLC was baked into the game, implemented naturally, and offered brand new costumes at no extra cost. Persona 5 Royals DLC decides to offer new costumes for the Phantom Thieves, exclusive and overpowered Personas, as well as lock 5 out of 6 challenge battles behind a paywall. First off, the costumes. While they're very fun and offer lots of fan service for the most part, you notice that Persona 5 Royal has zero new costumes baked into the base game. These were all made to be sold as DLC. It's hard not to think back to Persona 4 Golden and its costume shop, which offered a wide variety of costumes to unlock naturally through your playthrough. Special shout out to Kasumi, who gets a $15 costume pack separate from all the other Phantom Thieves, and insult to injury, can only be used in the last part of the game. This means that Kasumi's DLC has to be unlocked at the very end of your playthrough and can only be used in two locations in the metaverse. Downloadable personas are so overpowered that it is actually a joke and should be avoided at all cost that Joker's third persona evolution is locked behind a paywall for no actual reason, even though the rest of his teammates can have their third forms unlocked naturally at the end of the game. Finally, there's the challenge battles. This new score attack mode is offered to the player in the Velvet Room by the Twin Wardens, and is actually a very fun mode that has you trying to score as many points as possible based off your damage, with themed demons to go up against. The only problem with that, the game only allows you to fight in one battle, out of six total, and then proceeds to show you the remaining five battles are locked behind a $10 DLC paywall. Mind you, that two of these battles feature the protagonist from Persona 3 and Persona 4 with their voice actors reprising their roles just for these fights. The worst part about this DLC is that it's actually the most fun with the challenge battles. There is a lot of unique ideas that went behind it, and the higher difficulty levels make it really fun for replay value. But straight up locking new content behind a paywall directly in front of your players is just not right for any game and aggressively anti-consumer no matter how you look at it. I purchased all of the DLC for the purpose of this review. I purchased all of the DLC for the purpose of this review, and normally would tell fans to just pick up whatever DLC they really want, but this leads to one last odd point for Western fans. Instead of DLC being sold separately, most of the DLC is bundled together and forces you to buy them from select bundles. The reasoning behind this was probably just to give players a better deal, bundling more things, and hoping to save more money. Instead, it has led to fans buying DLC bundles for a game that never needed completed content to be sold back in the first place. And it really is a shame that the only reason we keep having this happen is because it's worked in games in the past. So after spending over 100 hours playing through and platinuming Persona 5 Royal, I can almost say as many negatives as I can positives when it comes down to the new content as well as changes. I don't necessarily feel like most of the complaints are nitpicks either, and more so comes from the fact that this is being released as the quote unquote definitive version of a game on the same platform it launched only three years later. This to me seems like it welcomes more criticism when you are selling it as a $60 brand new title. The original Persona 5 can be bought for around $10 on either platform it launched on. 
So, while the experience of Persona 5 Royal refines so many things and is easily one of the best JRPGs the PlayStation 4 has to offer, it just never hit me with that aha moment, such as why this game had to be a standalone $60 game again. Obviously though, if I meet people who are interested in jumping into the world of Persona, I can easily recommend Persona 5 Royal just like I did with Persona 4 Golden when it launched on the Vita back in 2012. Returning fans will also be met with new moments, gameplay fixes, and even a surprisingly superior game to the original Persona 5. But the core problems of that game haven't been completely fixed, only placed next to newer, shinier features and parts. Atlas really did something unexpected with the new elements presented in Persona 5 Royal. Sadly though, these changes never have enough of a rippling effect on the game that just came out three years prior. Maybe if instead, more time had gone into developing the quality of life changes into the story and world building of Persona 5, instead of holding all of the new story changes till the very end, it wouldn't have felt so uneven. Still though, the blending of gameplay changes and keeping what made the original gameplay loop so satisfying cannot be understood stated enough. The new characters have easily become some of my favorite in the entire series. The ending sent chills down my spine. I learned to love characters like Adachi in ways I never thought possible. And I easily will spend another dozen hours or so in the Thieves Den playing Tycoon by myself, just crying at the fact that there are no multiplayer options. Still, the highs can't make up for the fact that DLC has never felt more unwelcome in an Atlas game since Persona 3 and 5 Dancing. Kasumi is left on the sidelines for far, far, far too long, and it feels like most of the game's budget was saved for the New Year content all the way at the end. Persona 5 is still a great game, and Persona 5 Royal is an even greater game built on that foundation. And everything present in Royal still hasn't stopped me from recommending people play this game as soon as possible. Just know that mistakes were made, and it is far from being the greatest RPG of all time, let alone 2020. Now, before I wrap this video up and go back to waiting for Persona 5 Scramble to be announced for a Western release, I just want to say thank you all so much for checking out this video review. I have never done a video review like this in the past, and I have been long overdue for one. My last video review was Shin Megami Tensei Devil Survivor 2 Record Breaker for the 3DS all the way back in 2014. I would love to know what you guys think of my review. If you guys like to see me do more, I'm planning on making a Tokyo Mirage Sessions Encore review next. I was actually planning on having that review out before this, but things kind of got crazy. By the time I beat Tokyo Mirage Sessions, I moved on to my import copy of Scramble. Scramble moved on into Royal, and here we are today. But either way, if you've played this game, I would love to know what you guys think, so let me know in the comments below. And I'm also, I am still a pretty small channel here on YouTube, and would really appreciate anyone who can subscribe. It super, super helps out. You can follow me on Twitter at Torchwood4SP, that is my personal account, and you can follow my podcast for Shin Megami Tensei Network at SMT Network. Have a good one, guys.